Good evening. You're watching the India Story with me, Vikram Chandra. This week, our focus is on the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the United States, which begins next week. According to reports, his high-profile and jam-packed schedule includes participation in nearly a dozen significant events, address to the U.S. Congress, a state dinner, interactions with top American CEOs and members of the Indian diaspora, plus some key defense deals that are also likely to be signed between Prime Minister Modi and the American President Joe Biden. We're going to be finding out more about the significance of this crucial visit in this episode with the former ambassador to the U.S., Mira Shankar, and also Trisha Ray, who's the Deputy Director, Center for Security, Strategy and Technology, ORF. Also on the show, the Supreme Court has reserved its verdict on a batch of pleas seeking legal recognition for same-sex marriage in India. We speak to Mario De Penha, petitioner in the same-sex marriage case, and also the BJP MP Swapan Das Gupta on the issue. It is Pride Month. A lot of people are focusing uh, attention on that, waiting for the verdict. What's expected? We're going to be finding out in that conversation. And our special newsmaker of the week, director Hansel Mehta, on the success of his new show, Scoop, based on a prison memoir by journalist Jigna Vora, who was arrested in connection with the murder of another crime reporter. So a lot coming up for you on this program, but first, a look at the major headlines. The UK-based leader of Khalistani organizations and the alleged handler of Amritpal Singh, Aftar Khanda, has died in London. Khanda was reportedly responsible for orchestrating the removal of the Indian flag during an anti-Indian... The Union Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar termed the allegation as an outright lie. Jack Dorsey had said that Twitter has come under considerable pressure in India, including uh, threats of raids. The Indian government has said that Twitter under Dorsey had problems in accepting the sovereignty of Indian law. Now to the big story that we're going to be tracking for a while, the visit of Prime Minister Modi to the US and several path-breaking deals that may also be signed during that particular trip. Now these visuals on your screen are from eight years ago. They show a game-changing moment for the Indian military, especially the Air Force, when Prime Minister Modi and the then French President Francois Hollande announced the significant Rafale fighter jet deal in France. But are we set to witness an even bigger watershed moment for the Indian forces, the Indian Defence Ministry and Indian Foreign Policy next week? That's when Prime Minister Narendra Modi flies to the United States on June the 21st. It will already be a notable trip. He will be just the third Indian leader to be accorded the honour of a state visit by the United States. He will join an elite club by addressing the US Congress for the second time. He will put the International and International Yoga Day by participating in an event at the United Nations. And in what's now become a signature event, he will be giving a speech to large crowds of Indian Americans at a concert-like event. Now, it may seem difficult to believe, but it's possible that all of those things could be overshadowed by something else and something substantial. There are very strong rumours that Prime Minister Modi and the American President Joe Biden 
will make a few announcements that could have a lasting impact and that may well help to make India a powerhouse of advanced weapons productions. So what are these announcements likely to be? And there are strong indications that many of these are going to be happening. The first is the production of fighter jet engines in India. Hindustan Aeronautics Limited and General Electric are expected to sign a deal to make the F-414 engine in India. This could be a path-breaking deal which would likely to power India's future fighter jets including the Tejas Mk2, the advanced medium combat aircraft and the twin-engine deck-based fighter. Future collaborations are expected to include making engines for warships. Next, the US has for a while been pressurizing India or pushing India or persuading India to buy advanced drones such as the MQNB Sea Guardian armed drones, also called the Predator in a different format. India could soon have the Predator, it could have the Sea Guardian and this a deal which is expected to cost something like three billion dollars may well come through on this particular trip. There, there, there's some hurdles that could still be there um, including Delhi's push for making components in India but strong indications that this deal could possibly come up next week itself. Another deal that is being spoken about, will the US chip maker Micron invest a large sum of money which could be as high as $10 billion in India in a semiconductor fab? Talks for a facility in India are reportedly at the advanced stage and there is some talk that this could be coming through next week as well. And this is also significant because there's been some question as to what's happening between Micron and its investments in China, some talk about blacklisting. Of course, that controversy in China is playing itself out, but will Micron be making a major bet on India? We'll wait to see. And also there's been talk about the Indian and the US NSAs talking about kick-starting quantum coordination mechanisms with the signing of a MOU on semiconductors and also on uh, quantum computing. So all of that likely to come up. Now the Biden government may also be trying to convince the Indian delegation to buy the FA-18 Super Hornet fighter jets for the Indian Navy. Now this of course has been on for a while, those particular uh, conversations. Clearly, I don't think it's at an advanced trade and unlikely to happen next week, but that discussion could come up. The entire Make in India program, of course, is expected to expand in the coming years to include combat vehicles, harbitzers, ordnance, and a number of other weapons platforms. Now, let's just give you a little bit of perspective on all of this. Just a few days ago, the Indian and the American defense ministers finalized a roadmap for cooperation in the defense industry for the next few years. Reports say that Delhi and Washington are now busy preparing an ambitious, robust outcome document which would then shape the Indo-US relationship for decades to come. All of this is hectic activity and it's quite momentous for several reasons and they are reasons that potentially benefit both sides. The biggest of these is that the Americans are very picky about sharing defence technology. So the new deals show India's importance. And from New Delhi's point of view, these deals would insulate Indian arms acquisitions from issues like what's the fallout of wars, could there be sanctions, what's happening with American policy with country A, country B. It elevates it above that, it makes it a bit more strategic and it helps give a certain amount of clarity for years and decades to come. Let's face it, it will be a strategic win for the USA if India is weaned away from Russian weapons altogether. This has been something that has been spoken about at great length in the last few years, especially in the aftermath of the Ukraine war. From an Indian point of view, domestic manufacturing would benefit from American technology. The transfer of advanced technology would help India to counter China. And then that in turn also does help America. If India is self-sufficient, if India becomes a military powerhouse, it relieves pressure on America also because then India can take charge of security in this part of the world, take care of security in the Indian Ocean, on the borders, on the western side of China. This is therefore a win-win for both sides. Economically, it's an economic boost for India because creation of weapons infrastructure in India, all those defence PSUs will do well, export revenues could kick in going forward. So that's the big picture. That's why there's a high amount of interest in this. That's why interests are broadly aligned. And that's why next week, 
you could actually expect a lot of forward direction, concrete deals actually being struck. Now, none of this is new. For a period of time, India and America have been building up their relations. The military relationship between India and the US has been steadily growing stronger in recent years. And let me now just give you a little bit of the backdrop. All of this began in earnest with the signing of the framework for US-India defense relationship in 2005. And then, of course, with the civil nuclear deal. That nuclear deal, the signing of the nuclear deal, enabled all of this to happen. It enabled the Americans and the Indians to start working together in areas of defense and in areas of high technology. Then, in 2012, the Defense Technologies and Trade Initiative, or the DTII, was announced. This was launched in 2012 to facilitate the development of defense technology by reducing bureaucratic processes and legal requirements. Four years later, India got the unique major defense partner status, and also something called LEMOA was signed. LEMOA or the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement. It is something which the US normally only signs with close allies for greater synergy and for strengthening military ties. It essentially allows either party or either side to take advantage of logistics. You can just have an American ship coming to an Indian port and refueling itself or the other way around. So that was another major framework agreement that was actually signed. In 2018, India was added to the Strategic Trade Authorization One list and also something called COMCASA was inked. This, the Communication Compatibility and Security Agreement, is one of the four foundational agreements that the Americans sign with close partners. And this is to facilitate the sale of high-end technology. And in 2020, the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement was done. Last year, the Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies, or ICET, was announced. Now, next week, the India-US Defense Acceleration Ecosystem, or Indus-X, will also be joined by the US IBC. So all of these are major agreements that are going to be in place. So what does this add up to? Obviously, there's been a considerable and a massive and a major transformation in ties between India and the United States, especially when it comes to technology and when it comes to areas like defense. But as always, you can say that the glass is half full. At the end of the day, military trade between India and the United States has seen a meteoric rise in recent years. In 2008, it was nearly zero. But very soon, total weapons purchases by India from the United States are expected to hit $25 billion, 2 lakh crore rupees. Now, these have included a wide range of platforms, Apache attack helicopters, Chinook choppers, M777 howitzer guns, P8I uh, surveillance aircraft, the C-130J and C-17 uh, transport planes, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, People could say, yeah, well, but New Delhi and Washington still don't have a jointly developed weapon system which can symbolize this relationship, like the very deadly BrahMos missile which was developed jointly by India and Russia. That's the sort of a thing perhaps we should move towards. So in such a situation, the recent agreements and the talks between New Delhi and Washington and Prime Minister Modi's expected announcements next week are much-needed positive steps. And it's not as if India is the only needy partner in this relationship. Both sides, as I've been telling you, stand to gain a lot if it works out and it works out successfully. And for more on this, I'm now being joined by Meera Shankar, the former Indian ambassador to the United States. Madam Ambassador, it's a pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure it must be heartening for you to see the depth of engagement and relationships that now seem to be rolling out between India and the United States, and presumably something that is going to see a massive acceleration next week as well. How do you see this visit of Prime Minister Modi and all the atmospherics that we are hearing about around this particular visit? Well, I think it's an important visit because there have been some differences over Ukraine and um, therefore, you know, some doubts uh, in certain quarters about the relationship. But the relationship is very solid because there is an increasing convergence of strategic interests 
and uh, also economic interests in the Asia Pacific region in particular. Uh, so um, I think the relationship has managed to weather the uh, turbulence caused by the differences over Ukraine, and that's a good thing. And uh, it's uh, an occasion to really uh, solidify the relationship in substantive terms. You know, we have been uh, talking about uh, cooperation in the field of defense through the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, not just for purchasing weapons, but also for joint research, joint development, joint production, but it really didn't take off. It uh, was confined to some pilot projects. Uh, now you have uh, two different things which have happened. One is that the Quad has become a much closer knit grouping which has been meeting at the highest level, at the summit level. And it has, while it's not strictly a military grouping, it actually has uh, identified several strategic sectors for cooperation, including critical and emerging technologies, uh, resilient supply chains, so, you know, we've just been looking at what are some of the specific deals that could be signed as that Micron deal, of course, the jet engine deal, which could be the big one, the question of drones, quantum computing. This could be some of the actual deliverables, if you like, from the trip. But on the symbolism part, it seems to be quite a warm embrace. The United States extending a state visit of this time, I think the Prime Minister is only going to become one of the, the third or a very small number of world leaders to actually address a joint session of the US Congress twice. So there is a lot of symbolism. Uh, is this unusual from the American side, this sort of a warm embrace? Yes, I think that um, this kind of symbolism was also extended to Manmohan Singh after the Indo-US nuclear deal, which was seen as a path-breaking initiative which enabled the two countries to overcome their differences on an issue which had clouded the relationship and prevented it from reaching its full potential. Of course, it also opened up the possibility for India to import natural uranium fuel for its civil nuclear power plants. And in a sense, integrated India into the international system, perhaps not as far as we would have liked, because we would have liked to be treated on par with the five nuclear weapon states. But uh, somewhere in between, we were integrated into the international system. So I think that was a special gesture. And this now is certainly a special gesture, particularly given the fact that in the recent past, there have been different points of view on Ukraine flowing from our own strategic imperatives and perspectives. Well, Ambassador Shankar, we've been uh, listening to a lot of the positives, of course, and talking about the positives, but they're also irritants and the downside. One, obviously the Americans would have wanted to see a lot more from India on the question of Russia and Ukraine, although they seem to have agreed to disagree on those questions. And then there's also that the possibility that those issues will come up, which India obviously hates countries talking to it about things like human rights or democracy or is democracy under threat under, uh, under India? What did Jack Dorsey just say? Um, so, you know, bad timing uh, just ahead of a trip like this. So do you think some of those irritants will come up in this visit or are they going to be papered over and pushed under the carpet and buried right now in light of all the major positive activity that will be taking place? Well, let me say that um, I think the Biden administration has tiptoed around these issues in a sense because their um, uh, assessment has been that uh, Prime Minister Modi is uh, a strong leader and that the uh, you know, converging strategic imperatives override some of these other concerns. Uh, but they do raise these issues 
in private conversations. So it's one of those issues, you know, strengthening the relationship with India on which there is a bipartisan consensus. You know, when this whole issue of Ukraine was being debated in the U.S. Congress and India's, you know, why is India not with us on this and so on, and concern was expressed over it, uh, then uh, I think many members also made the point that uh, the U.S. should do more to provide India the equipment and technology it needs for its defense to wean it away from Russia or to reduce its dependence on Russia. And I think that there has been an acceptance, grudging or otherwise, of the fact that India has very solid reasons for uh, you know, wanting to keep Russia on, uh, on board. All right, Ambassador Meena Shankar, thank you so much for joining us. Rather clear exposition of what we should expect next week. Now, you're going to hear a lot of talk, of course, about the atmospherics of Prime Minister Modi's visit and also those defence and other deals. But there's something else that could be happening next week that we would like to draw your attention to and keep an eye on it. And that is possible movement forward in the areas of high technology, discussions around it, perhaps even some signing of deals around it. That is something else that you should not lose sight of in all the excitement over defense deals. Joining me now to discuss that in more detail, Trisha Ray, Deputy Director, Center for uh, Security, Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research uh, Foundation. Uh, Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Look, there's going to be a lot of talk about uh, defense and other things when Prime Minister Modi is in the United States. But technology, digital technology, emerging technology, uh, quantum computing, for example, are, are those some of the areas where you also think there's going to be a lot of forward movement? Yes, certainly. So digital and emerging technologies are somewhat of a sunrise area in the US-India partnership. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that right now, India is one of the few emerging economies that still has a very positive growth outlook. Uh, so India is a promising market for a lot of, say, US companies, as well as global tech companies who want to continue growing. Uh, the other is that India has a burgeoning uh, digital India initiative, including things like digital public infrastructure that the rest of the world is also looking to emulate now. So in term, not just in terms of markets, but in terms of India's own tech exports, there's a lot of promise uh, for cooperation between US and India. Of course, the big question on advanced technology is that the United States has been very reluctant to share it with India. Now, after the, the civil nuclear deal, it has started to change. Is it changing more? Is the, are the Americans willing to share the most advanced technologies that they have with India now? Yes, I mean, that, that there is certainly some baggage dating back to the Cold War when it comes to U.S.-India relations, and India has been subject to export controls in the past, and some of that can still weigh heavily on uh, Indian policymaker thinking. But uh, I was in DC recently and I have spoken with US uh, Commerce Department and State Department officials, and that's certainly no longer the thinking on the US side. So they are looking to India as a promising partner in some of that French shoring initiatives. So reshoring uh, their own supply chains to partners that they trust, and India is cited as a trusted partner. So semiconductors, in which US and India recently signed an MOU is one such area. This is a sensitive technology that they've already linked to national uh, security interests and they want to partner with India on this. Are there any other areas where you think there could be some sort of a breakthrough in the near future? Now, we hear so much spoken about AI, of course, but there are other potential areas where the Chinese have a very clear edge over both the United States and India, and therefore some sort of collaboration and cooperation would make sense. Rare Earth, of course, comes to mind. Batteries, electric vehicles and battery technology. Uh, China, for example, has, uh, a, a, I think, a share more than the rest of the world put together. So are those the sort of areas where you think, uh, and perhaps any other area that catches your attention, where the Indians and the Americans can work together to counter the Chinese? Mm. No, rare arts is certainly an interesting one. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that in India, this is entirely public sector controlled, and Indian production of rare arts is 
really way below the threshold that we can be producing at. It could be an area of cooperation if the US chooses to invest in some of this. Uh, but yes, green tech is definitely something that could become an area of cooperation. So currently, China is the largest exporter of lithium ion batteries. And India is one of the largest importers in the world of such batteries. And last year, the government made a really big push uh, for electric vehicle adoption in the country. Where will these batteries come from? Uh, that's certainly a question that the US and India could think together uh, upon. Uh, but the first step really required on the US-India side is a shared understanding of what the risks really are on uh, relying on just China for these batteries. Because China hasn't weaponized these supply chains yet as it has in other areas. Yes, of course, China could weaponize it. China probably will weaponize it. And talking about weaponizing, la last question to you. On this entire question of defense and the sharing of sensitive and critical defense technology, because I think the U.S. seems to have finally woken up to a very important fact that if we can empower a range of partners in the Indo-Pacific, then we don't have to take the entire burden on ourselves. Now, that seems to be the thinking in the United States. So do you feel the U.S. is now prepared to share just about any advanced technologies with countries like India? Or are we not yet at that stage? Because somebody will say India is not a formal ally, it's not a treaty partner. So there are certain things that we should not yet share with India. Well, yes, that's a tricky question. I mean, India, yes, it's a rising trusted partner, but we're not, for example, the five eyes. We're not at that level of trust that is also backed by institutional arrangements that bring the two countries closer together. Again, I believe that the US does see India as a critical part of this security architecture that it is building in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but defense cooperation, aside from, say, some of these production deals that are being signed between the two countries, still has a ways to go. But as I said, uh, aside from China, India is the largest power in the Indo-Pacific. So this is a natural uh, closeness that is bound to come in the coming years. Trisha Ray from the URF, thank you so much for joining us with that important perspective. Let's move on now to our regular segment, a look at how the foreign media has been covering some of the top news stories coming out of India. The Economist had a lot, of course, on uh, India-American relationships and what's going to be happening when Prime Minister Modi goes there. But also a big article in The Economist on how India has overtaken China as a country with the largest diaspora in the world, with approximately 18 million individuals. The Indian diaspora has experienced notable achievements, says the economist. Uh, the Chinese diaspora has encountered suspicion in certain cases. Well, obviously, the foreign media piece that got the most amount of attention, including back in India, was the uh, American YouTube channel breaking points in its interview with Jack Dorsey, which, of course, is where the Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey accused the Indian government of censorship and making threats during his time as CEO. He said that India had made multiple requests uh, 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 concerning the 2021 farmers' protests and had made threats to shut down Twitter and conduct raids. As I told you earlier in the program, the Indian government did respond very strongly to that particular interview, saying that these statements were outright lies. Meanwhile, Human Rights Watch, and it was a joint report by Human Rights Watch and the Internet Freedom Foundation, which drew some attention to the negative consequences of internet shutdowns in India, and it said it does particularly affect the rights of impoverished and marginalized individuals. All right, let's move on to our next big story. June is Pride Month, and across the world, there have been celebrations to recognize all those who identify as LGBTQ and their allies in India as well. Pride Month serves as an occasion to talk about the ongoing fight for equality, basic rights, and, of course, the question of dignity. And this time, there's a lot being spoken about what is happening in the judiciary, what's happening legally, and on the question of rights uh, for people of the LGBTQ uh, community. Now, of course, there's a lot that's been happening in recent years and recent months. In 2018, of course, a landmark judgment. The Supreme Court struck down that 19th century law that had criminalized homosexuality in India. In a unanimous verdict, the Supreme Court's five-judge bench scrapped Section 377, which the then Chief Justice Deepak Mishra 
described as irrational, indefensible, and manifestly arbitrary. Almost five years later, in April this year, the Supreme Court began hearing several petitions seeking the legalization of same-sex marriage in India. Over the course of the 10-day hearing, the petitioners argued for the inclusion of societal recognition and equal legal rights for same-sex couples in marriage. They emphasized that same-sex couples should have equal rights in financial, medical, adoption and surrogacy matters. I am not able to nominate my partner for life insurance. Now, these are not theoretical issues. This is our life. Right? So, so therefore we say marriage because that is the notion, not only for society, but that is the notion that the legal framework, which is premised on common law, understand and takes within its fold. So not, therefore, my lords, respectfully, therefore the problem is that anything short of that, if it is a civil union, so this correspondence will now start, my lord. However, the centre and some other petitioners oppose this stance, asserting that the question of marriage is a little bit more complicated. It's intricately connected to religious and cultural norms. It falls under the purview, for example, of personal laws of various religions. It says that the definition of marriage and the fundamental right to marry and the constitutional and legal implications of same-sex marriage were all questions that need to be thought about a little bit more. And all of this is, of course, extensively discussed during the proceedings. Now, that particular verdict is being written as we speak. The verdict in the case was reserved by the Supreme Court. Uh, and lots of other things came up. The Supreme Court did make some broadly sympathetic remarks, especially at the beginning, but also stated it cannot anticipate how Parliament would respond to the entire issue and the entire question of where legislative power uh, ends and where judicial power begins all of that also became something that came up. So therefore, that particular verdict at the moment has been reserved by the Supreme Court. For Hindus, it is a sacrament. For Muslims, it's a sacred contract, but nonetheless a sacred contract. And across the faith, what is recognized as a marriage is between heterosexual. So is there at all a meeting point in all of those arguments and debates and discussions that we actually had? We are, of course, waiting for the Supreme Court's verdict, but perhaps it's time to step back a little bit and see what could actually be there in the verdict. Could there, for example, be a win-win situation in whatever the Supreme Court says that keeps all sides relatively happy? So now the temperatures have cooled a little bit. Let's try and have that, that actual discussion. Joining me now, Mario De Pena, who's one of the petitioners in the same-sex marriage case. Mario, uh, great to be uh, you know, talking to you. It is, of course, a Pride Month, so this entire question is coming up. The Supreme Court's reserved its verdict while you and the other petitioners wait for that verdict to come out. What is your thinking? What are you actually expecting could happen now? Well, we're all hoping, uh, Vikram, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, we're all hoping for a positive outcome of uh, some some kind uh, that outcome can be anything from a simple declaration that marriage is a fundamental right uh, for all Indians uh, or it could be something more substantial where the learned judges you know wade into all the rights that married couples are given in this country and May they may make an intervention to say uh, that these are the rights uh, that queer people also uh, should have. We're hoping for something on that range. Um, I think the judges have been extremely fair to both sides uh, in, in the hearings in the Supreme Court. Um, and as activists, of course, we have nothing but hope. Right, Maribel, at this point, I guess everyone sits and looks at what is the body language, what's likely to come out. A lot of what is said in court often does not go into the actual judgment. So what's in the actual judgment uh, is not something we'll know until it is delivered. But um, when you take a look at some of what is being discussed around the entire question, obviously there seems to be a certain amount of sympathy on questions like dignity and respect and uh, how people should be treated in a, in a sensitive manner. 
Other questions are around what can happen technically, what should be left to parliament, what happens to the specific nitty gritties of succession and adoption and what happens legally to that and what the Supreme Court can, can say. So, what are, you expecting, what are you expecting out of this? Is it basically the question of respect that should somehow be addressed? Yes, absolutely, because it's always been a question of dignity for the community. Um, you know, very often people, you know, there was a discussion in the in at, at some point uh, between the the chief justice and uh, the solicitor general, and they were thinking about some, you know, giving some kinds of rights, perhaps uh, in terms of pensions, uh, gratuities, um, and they were trying to explore what to what extent the government could step in. Uh, and I think uh, while something like that would be great, of course, I think it leaves out the question of dignity that marriage grants to all citizens who, you know, ask for that right in India. And so dignity is very central uh, to, to, our, to our demands of the Supreme Court. Mary, absolutely. Look, the question of dignity, the question of respect, I really don't think that's too much in doubt right now, especially after that landmark unanimous judgment on Section 377. The question of dignity and respect, I don't think it's something that is in doubt, and it is something that hopefully is going to come through in the verdict. What would it take in the verdict for you to say, OK, we've got what we wanted from the point of view of respect and dignity and sensitivity? From the point... It is, I, I, for, for us, at least within the secular laws, when we're not making a claim on the religious laws or on the personal laws of this country, uh, at least within the secular laws, to say that we have the right to, you know, to get married to the people we love. That is, that is extremely, extremely important for us. When the Special Marriage Act was being discussed in the Lok Sabha in the 1950s. You know, Pandit Nehru actually talked about how it how he hoped that most Indians, even those who are not covered uh, by the personal laws, would you know would uh, approach uh, the local officials to get married under the Special Marriage Act. Now, perhaps he didn't imagine queer people approaching local officials to get married in that way. But uh, at that time, it was mostly people who, you know, who weren't covered by the religious or the caste laws of their time. So perhaps that we weren't in his imagination, but actually we do fit that definition. All right, Mario, thank you so much for joining us. We will, of course, keep on talking about this, and we'll certainly talk once the actual verdict comes out, and we'll be, we'll be trying to analyze it. Uh, let's get a slightly different perspective on all of this. It's a great pleasure now to be joined by Swapan Das Gupta, who's been writing extensively on this entire question of same-sex marriage. He's also, of course, uh, a senior BJP uh, leader. Uh, Swapan, uh, thanks so much for joining us. We're, of course, waiting for that Supreme Court judgment and for that verdict to be delivered, presumably being written right now. Many people are saying it could be a landmark judgment one way or the other. What's your own thought process? What's your expectation on this verdict? Well, initially, I, I was under the apprehension that uh, we would probably uh, have a judgment which is so radical that it will be difficult for society to digest. And, and that stemmed from some of the initial remarks uh, made by the Chief Justice about, you know, gender, etc., about not being... You're, you're talking about the time where you said there's no absolute man or absolute woman. That That's what you're referring to. Exactly, you know. So gender is not determined by birth, is what he, he, what he uh, said. You know, quite radical stuff like that. And, uh, well, subsequently, I think things have been brought to a more even key. Now, there are various issues which really have to be de decided. The first one, which to me is very, very important, is that a legislation, uh, uh, that an uh, enactment of the extension of marriage to the same, to, to same sex couples necessarily involves a redefinition of the very notion of marriage itself. It's a dramatic, it, it, it's not an insignificant 
modification it's 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 it changes the fundamental concept of it now whether such a thing whether such a uh, reinterpretation can be affected by the courts or it needs a wider forum notably parliament to discuss now you, you can well say why has parliament been evading its responsibility and i think that that's a very fair question to ask because on the question of the decriminalization of homosexual relations for example 377 of the penal code it i believe it was should parliament which should have decriminalized it but parliament refused to get into to that debate and allowed it to go to the courts and allowed a court judgment to set the tone now are we going to see such a thing happening again here so i think but the point is that the demand for same sex marriage has actually not come in any significant way from from the ground there have been some small activist groups and concerned individuals who've done it but there's been no real stirring on the ground unlike three, the question of 377 and the question of decriminalization of uh, homosexuality th this has not happened so we are caught in this thing are we imposing a minute agenda on society okay shopping shopping that's let's just look at two specific things that for example the petitioners and others you've been speaking to are saying number one it's a first and foremost a question of dignity. So allow something to happen that allows us to live with basic dignity. That, that's part A. Part B, yes, help us in dealing with some of the issues that come around our lives. Issues of inheritance and succession and all those many, many complicated issues that require a practical solution. Which, for example, is something that the Central Committee could be helpful with. It could try and find a practical answer to those practical issues. But if the judgment comes which says, give this, these particular communities a certain sense of dignity to people who want to be in some sort of a union and want to live in a union with dignity, would there be a problem with that? No, I have no proper problem with that. As I said, a civil partnership, anything which says that these are two, we, we, we shall treat these two individuals as an item, as a couple, whatever you, what you want to call, you, you can use any. How about spouse? Any, any sort of uh, terms for it. Uh, but, but, but the important thing, thing is marriage. You know, the definition, whether, whether we should call it a marriage, you can call it a civil partnership. You can call it a partnership. I have absolutely, and the question of dignity, I believe is right. They deserve that, that that's a particular lifestyle they've chosen that that's a life choice they've made and they deserve to uh, be respected for that because they made it consciously now whether the rest of society agrees with them we we cannot outlaw prejudice you un understand that so there will be prejudice but at least there'll be no prejudice uh, that, but that prejudice will be tempered by the fact that at least there has been some recognition that this is a legitimate union so you're saying that there should be a judgment that actually makes everybody happy by allowing same-sex unions to be there with dignity. Just don't call it a marriage, is what you're saying. Call them spouse or something else, and that you feel were, would be okay. Is that what you're saying? Let's not go the full hog for the moment. Okay. Because I think you need a wider consultation in society. You need to look, look at all the implications there is. And you've got to realize that India is also a deeply conservative society where you've got to go at things in phases that the most radical elements of society cannot set the tone that's really what all i'm going to say exercise cautious be circumspect in what you're doing keep in mind the dignity of individuals but keep in mind the sensitivities of society also all right shapandas gupta thank you so much for being with us we will of course wait for that verdict and then analyze it in in some detail once it actually happens and finally let's now move to our newsmaker tonight and he is someone who's done it yet again after delivering one of the most successful shows on the indian ott platforms only three years ago acclaimed director hansel mehta is back with his latest series scoop 
which has quickly become one of the most talked about shows. Scoop, which is trending since its release, essentially centers around the real life story of a Mumbai based crime reporter who was arrested for the murder of a fellow journalist. And Hansan Mehta now joins us right here on this program. Hansal, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you with us, Hansal. I, I can't go anywhere. I can't go for a dinner. I can't come to the studio. I can't talk to anybody without them telling me, have you seen Scoop yet? And you must watch it. So that's, that's the good news for you. So you've done it again. Um, how, are you, how are you judging the response to Scoop? It's quite overwhelming, Vikram. Uh, you know, thank you for having me on uh, your show. Uh, yeah, it is. It's it's quite overwhelming. Uh, you know, particularly uh, given that you know there was no attempt to replicate the uh, success or the style of Scam 1992. You know, otherwise there's a temptation that uh, you sort of repeat yourself, uh, having seen uh, success in one thing. So uh, in that sense, uh, it feels. You know that a vindication of your belief that a good story will find its audience. Ansar, one thing you know that's common to both Scam and Scoop and also to a couple of the films that you've made, you seem to believe, and perhaps correctly so, that the most interesting stories are fictionalized accounts of real life stories that have actually happened. So it's not a writer's imagination. All of this has actually happened. Now let's tell that story, fictionalize that a little bit, dramatize that a little bit, but tell a real story. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, one of the things since I made Shahid, uh, in fact, since I made uh, one of my first films, Dilpe Matliya, I believe that, you know, uh, my uh, calling as a storyteller, as a filmmaker is to tell, to chronicle our times. And so that uh, through these stories, I'm to do, uh, trying to chronicle our times through the stories of uh, people that who would uh, people who otherwise would be marginalized because history is only about leaders about conquests about uh, you know kings and princes and queens uh, so i'm trying to tell these uh, uh, tell the stories of our times capture them on this medium uh, you know through the stories of uh, regular people like uh, all of us uh, and uh, to tell you uh, how the how this these times have affected the ordinary man you know the, me, the media the trial by media judgment uh, uh, because of the media trial and uh, how uh, you know the judiciary and various things have affected our lives uh, today you know Samantha, one of the most interesting things about telling stories that are based on real life is who is a hero who is a villain who is a good person who is a bad person now, sometimes in real life, they're actually shades of grey. Harshad Mehta and Scam 92, obviously there were shades of grey and what he did. But even if you're a portrayal of this particular situation, there were some shades of grey. Was she, was she too busy with her career, not focusing enough on the kids? You know, things like that. How do you show those shades of grey? Yeah, uh, I think there are shades of grey in all of us. And uh, I think that fascinates me, that we are all imperfect. And, uh, and, you know, uh, because we are imperfect, we are human. So, uh, you know, it's a lot about the human condition, about, uh, uh, you know, not one-dimensional characters. That journalists, uh, you know, everybody is stereotyped. You know, if you're uh, the only extraordinary people, somehow it feels like, you know, the people who uh, rule us uh, are seen as extraordinary people. Uh, we, uh, on the other hand, are uh, people, uh, you know, either we are very virtuous or we are like completely black. You know, it's, it's so black and white. And that stereotyping has, uh, you know, us as storytellers have also succumbed to that kind of stereotyping. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm interested in that. You know, my, when I made my film Shahid, you know, Shahid was not exactly perfect. So, you know, I... Uh, I was fascinated by that imperfection. I was fascinated by the fact that, yeah, he might be an ordinary person, but, uh, you know, what is his story? You know, what is the larger thing uh, that he, uh, his story can leave behind for us as a, uh, as, as the human race? 
so uh, i think that exploration uh, which is why you know if, even if you look at this you know usually cops are painted as either very very virtuous or they're painted as somebody who's like very uh, they are villains you know the very stereotypical uh, uh, portrayals but if you look at uh, the policemen in this you know you don't really know you can't you know they start off as uh, you know morally very uh, ambiguous almost uh, black and then slowly they uh, you see them humanized and that i think that and that is important to look at all of them everybody lives in his own circle of uh, compulsions Hans Mehta thank you so much for being with us such a pleasure talking to you and looking forward to your next work which we will of course come back and talk to you about yet again but thanks a lot for for being with us and that's all we have for you on this episode